Hi, this video is two hours of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Trivia. If you know what an iceberg chart is, uh, it's one of those. Anyway, let's just get started. Moderate fan. All right, we're getting a bit deeper now. This segment of the iceberg contains entries of a similar caliber to the previous section. If you know about all of these, you'll only get a few weird looks from your friends and family. I'll try my best to keep explaining these in as much detail as I can. Vento Oreo PS2 game. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5 Golden Wind is a fan favorite, especially amongst Japanese audiences. So I find it no surprise that this exists, the Vento Oreo PS2 game. For clarification, just in case you're unaware, part 5 of the manga is called Vento Oreo in Japan. The name Golden Wind was more or less an anime-only change. Anyway, back to gaming! One of the reasons you may not have heard of this title in comparison to other JoJo console games on this iceberg is because this game was never given a release in the West. Launching exclusively in Japan on July 25th, 2002, Geo Geo's Bizarre Adventure would be the second and final time that Capcom would be given the opportunity to work on a JoJo video game adaptation. While Heritage was more of a 2D sprite-based fighting game, Geo Geo was more of a 3D action beat-em-up with a heavy focus on single-player boss battles. Being an adaptation of Golden Wind's main plot, the game features a total of 22 chapters, with nearly all of them consisting of boss fight type encounters that pit the player against the vast rogues gallery of Passion. Though I should emphasize the word adaptation here, because while most of the game's plot is identical to the manga, there are a couple of key differences. Most most interesting of which being the complete removal of Koichi Hirose from the story. Yeah, everybody's favorite short king was axed sometime during development. Footage taken from early builds of the game do feature him as well as Echoes Act 3 with fully rendered 3D models, but they were later removed for unknown reasons. Though of course, we can speculate. What I personally think is that the developers removed Koichi to further streamline and isolate the game's story for new players. Contrary to what this game's existence might make you think, not every JoJo part was given a playable video game adaptation beforehand. The only video games that existed under the JoJo brand at this point were based solely on part 3. Diamond is Unbreakable, which introduced Koichi, never got the same treatment, which I personally think fucking sucks, because as we all know, part 4 of JoJo is indeed goaded with the sauce. So without a Diamond is Unbreakable game existing, this means that Koichi's inclusion could have made for a higher barrier of entry. While Geo Geo was already meant to be a game for longtime fans to enjoy, Capcom obviously wanted it to be accessible to as many people as possible, even if they didn't have a familiar familiarity with the series beforehand. This is gonna sound shocking, but appealing to new potential customers is a must to maximize profits. Koichi's removal was most likely intended to allow new players to hop in without any prior knowledge or fear of missing out. Now with all that said, did Koichi's removal actually help the game appeal to more people? Not really. Critics agreed that the game was still a bit inaccessible for new people, with some noting that it seemed to be mostly targeted at those who were already fans of the series. At the very least, everyone seemed to unanimously agree that otherwise, it was a fairly faithful and impressive manga to video game rework. The Japanese video game magazine Famitsu even gave it a score of 31 out of 40. Pretty impressive for a licensed title. Now, of course, much like other older games, its visuals can seem a bit dated now, but the game's art style saves it from looking too bad. I will say, though, that the game's models can look a bit off at times when compared to the source material. In retrospect, they look even funnier when compared to the most recent adaptations of these characters. Like, <laughs> take a look at these. The game's models look crunchy when put side by side like this. Speaking of comparison, Giorno's voice in this game is way younger when contrasted to his other incarnations, and even other JoJo's in general. Like, take a listen to this. What is this? It's 
These days, it feels like a weird choice for the character, though it makes sense when you remember that Jorno is supposed to be canonically 15 years old. Yeah, that's something we seem to forget about these characters a lot. They may not look it, but they are young. During the events of Part 3, Jotaro is supposed to be a 17-year-old high schooler. Like, w what? Normally, I'd just say suspension of disbelief, or, you know, it's just his art style, but there's gotta be a limit to that, right? I know that puberty can sometimes hit kids like a truck, but it hit Jotaro like like a minivan. No, 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 not a minivan, like, like a bus or a train. But, but, I digress. I'm getting a bit off topic. Back to Blonde Boy. This interpretation of Jorno was actually voiced by a rather well-known Japanese voice actress, Romy Park. And in a strange twist of fate, she would go on to voice another blonde-haired 15-year-old protagonist, Edward freaking Elric from Full Metal Alchemist. Imagine being typecast as the coolest fucking characters imaginable. What, what the hell? Now, I personally haven't played the game myself as of the making of this video, I just haven't had the time, but I've heard from some friends that it can get fairly difficult, especially later on. You may wonder how exactly my friends could have played this game properly at all, especially when they don't know Japanese and the game wasn't released outside of Japan, and well, the explanation is actually something pretty exciting. As I said before, this game was never officially translated into English. It had a planned release in Western territories for quite a while, but nothing ended up coming from it for whatever reason. But just like other things in this community, that didn't stop fans from doing it themselves. This is super cool. Back in 2018, the fan translation group JoJo's Colored Adventure released a full English translation patch for the original game. This was done in collaboration with Joey Jojo's Wacky Trip and fully retranslates the entirety of the game's content into English for Western fans to enjoy. It's fairly rare for fan projects of this high a quality to exist, nevertheless be finished at all, so this is really cool. If what I've talked about the game so far was striking to you in any way, you can find the English patch floating around online to try it for yourself. I freaking love stuff like this. It just goes to show that fans are capable of so much. I, I just love it. I, I love it. Unzip's Dick. Unzip's Dick is a meme image showcasing Bruno Bucciolati from Part 5 making a suggestive face, more often than not used as a reaction post to something else. Bruno is well known for his stand Sticky Fingers, which has the ability to place zippers on various objects and appendages. So, of course, shit posters took that and just kinda ran with it. I think it's one of those memes that has a weird implication on purpose. When you look at it initially, you could assume that it means he's just unzipping his pants, but I'm a much bigger fan of the other potential context where he gets so horny that he zips his own dick off. From what I can gather, uh, the text of the meme has its origins tracing back to 4chan, with it originally coming from an anonymous user posting a comment that read, Feed on this, unzips dick. People found this strange post pretty amusing, eventually shortening the phrase to just unzips dick and pairing it with Bucciolati from Jojo for reasons stated earlier. Another meme to add to the ever-growing collection, quality notwithstanding. Clamp in Wonderland. All right, this is one of my favorite ones on here, no joke. Clamp is an all-female Japanese manga artist group that formed in the mid-1980s. You may not know their name particularly, but you've probably seen their work before, as they're most well-known for the creation of Card Captor Sakura and developing the designs for the anime Code Geass. Back in 1994, the group had put together an event to help advertise their fan-created content in doujinshi, which was called Clamp in Wonderland. For anyone potentially uninitiated, doujinshi is a Japanese term used to describe self-published works. In the case of Clamp, this refers to their original manga as well as fan works based on other popular series. Of course, one notable property that the group would tackle in their fan works and would feature in their event was JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. You can even see it prominently featured in the fanzine cover that I'm showing you right now. Although, I'm unsure as to why Sonic the Hedgehog is there, and why he's so small. Joseph doesn't seem to mind though. He looks shockingly unfazed by it. Definitely couldn't be me. If I saw Sonic in real life, I'd lose my shit. 
the fan work that was included inside of the doujin went under the title of Jojo's Bizarre Married Life. It was an obviously not even close to canon story that chronicled Jotaro Kujo's life after the insane events of Stardust Crusaders finale. Just a few things to note here before we go forward and talk about its story. It's a common misconception that this doujinshi made its premiere during the Clamp in Wonderland event. In reality, it had existed before this, but Clamp in Wonderland is what popularized it and what it's most associated with. Also, despite what the title may have you think, this story doesn't concern Jotaro's actual wife from Part 6, or Jolene whatsoever. As I said before, this event was held in 1994. Stone Ocean's original manga run started later in 2000. Thus, certain future events aren't referenced or connected in any way. I feel like the best way to think about this story is to view it as a kind of weird alternate history tale that happens after the events of part 3. Alright, with all that said and done, let's break down the plot of Jojo's Bizarre Married Life. Our story actually begins in Clamp Laboratory number 6, a short printed fanzine which was the sixth and final release of Clamp's zine series under the Clamp Laboratory banner. Clamp in Wonderland would be advertised in the back of this book for the summertime. However, within its glossy pages were the first few chapters of this epic story. After the events of Stardust Crusaders, but somehow paradoxically with all of its protagonists and Dio still alive, guess they all called it true and decided to play some Mario Kart or something. As it turns out, our main man Kakyoin is forced to sign marriage documents and become a stay-at-home housewife to our main man, Jotaro Kujo. The reason behind this isn't outright stated, but I mean like, come on man, let's be real. The comic then jumps forward a bit and showcases Kakyoin attempting to make a breakfast for his friends for the very first time, but is sadly then thwarted in his trade wife duties by none other than the murderous vampire Dio Brando, who uses the power of his stand to eat all of the food while time is stopped. I'ma be real man, I'd use the world for that shit too. His evil is not rewarded however, as it is revealed after the time stop that all of Kakyoin's food is, in fact, just horrible. <laughs> Seeing what ingredients he likes to use, I'm not surprised. And this causes Dio to become extremely ill. At some point after this, the Crusaders become very curious when Jotaro and Kakyoin go to bed together, with Joseph taking the initiative to do what is best and definitely not insanely creepy and invasive by using Hermit Purple and a TV set to peek in at them. As is predictable, they all immediately regret their actions once they receive their vision, with Jotaro scolding them all the next day and Kakyoin rightfully returning to his own house. However, despite the tumultuous hurdles of married life, Kakyoin wakes up in the morning to discover that he has, in fact, laid an egg. Yeah, he laid an egg. Just, just don't question it. After Kakyoin reveals the egg to his friends and explains what he think happened, they take it surprisingly well, all things considered. When the baby eventually hatches, he is revealed to have a star-shaped birthmark on his shoulder, confirming his destined fate to, uh, also run Dio out of his kitchen at breakfast time. I don't know. They end up naming their child Jota Kujo. Said child then goes to grow at an alarming rate, not unlike that weird animatronic Twilight baby. He actually ends up growing so fast that he's even able to attend school within a week of his freakish hatching. Jealous that his child is a child and gets attention for it, Jotaro decides the best course of action is, for some reason, to fight his baby to the death. However, in doing so, he inadvertently needles Jota into awakening his own stand, which looks like a more chibi looking version of Star Platinum. Too lazy to offer a suggestion for the stand's name, Polnareff insists that Jotaro is the one to name it. And so, annoyed by this, Jotaro walks to the kitchen, grabbing the first thing he can find, a brand of green dish soap named Charmy Green, which he then names his child's stand after. Yeah, his child's psychic essence is named after Charmy Green Dish Soap. Great fatherly instincts there, Jotaro. Great dad overall. If you ever have a second kid, you can always name it Downy Ultra Soft. So yeah, now we have the new character, Jota Kujo, and his stand, Charmy Green. 
After 10 years have passed, Jota is now old enough to go to high school, and ends up becoming the best of pals with part 4 protagonist Josuke Higashikata. Their friendship crumbles, however, when Josuke congratulates Jotaro and Kakyoin on their marriage, because Jota resents his father for the one time he tried to square him up. Which, yeah, you know, makes sense. Unfortunately, despite the gripping narrative going on here, this would ultimately be the last we saw of Jojo's bizarre married life. This doesn't mean that Clamp forgot about their strange fanfiction, however, as it would also again be referenced in the Clamp in Wonderland series of music videos produced by Studio Madhouse. Yes, you heard me right. Studio Madhouse. The studio who made such bangers as Perfect Blue, Trigun, Black Lagoon, Death Note, Paprika, Wolf Children, Parasite the Maxim, One Punch Man, and even the 2011 Hunter x Hunter anime. They collaborated with Clamp to produce promotional music videos for the Clamp in Wonderland event. It featured characters from their previous works, stretching from 1989 to 1994, with a later sequel featuring even more Clamp characters going all the way up until 2006. Both of these were released on DVD on October 26th, 2007, as Clamp in Wonderland 1 and 2, 1989 to 2006. The first music video even features Jota and Charmy Green from JoJo's Bizarre Married Life, as well as an older Jota right here before the credits roll. It's kind of bizarre to think about how Studio Madhouse animated a JoJo fanfiction character before the JoJo series itself got an official full anime adaptation. This would be the last time that we ever saw Jota in any sort of media created by Clamp, so with that, I have to say, we'll miss you Jota Kujo. Gone, but never forgotten. As if anyone could forget the weird egg baby. Trader Fugo. Hanakata Fugo of Jojo Part 5, Golden Wind, is quite the interesting fellow indeed. Part of our main gang of Pashon, his presence is often widely discussed because of his eventual and somewhat anticlimactic departure from the story. However, did you know that this parting of ways was as uneventful as it was for a reason? You see, apparently, in Araki's initial drafts for Part 5, Fugo was originally going to stay with the group, but be revealed later on as a spy working for the boss, Diavolo. This would then eventually lead to a fight between him and his former friends. This obviously didn't end up happening though, leading many to speculate on why these plans never came to fruition. Some have even falsely claimed that Araki wrote him out of the story because he had believed that Fugo's stand, Purple Haze, was much too powerful to be defeated and for whatever reason, couldn't think of a satisfying way for the gang to overcome him in battle. While this may be an interesting theory, uh, that's kinda all it is. A baseless theory that originated in the community via hearsay. I see this specific tidbit tossed around a lot on social media and Reddit, and yeah, I do understand that it sounds kind of realistic, but if you look a bit deeper, there's no sources to back it up whatsoever. It's just not real. However, contrary to the previous claims, there is indeed an actual confirmed explanation as to Fugo's weird treatment within the story. It all stems from Araki's headspace at the time, and is best elaborated on in a direct quote from the man himself in included in one of the volume releases. There was one part in this fifth series I absolutely had to delete, an episode I couldn't write at all. In my head, the story went that between Mista, Narancha, Fugo, and Abakio, there would be a spy working for the boss. At first, I decided this traitor to be Fugo, but I couldn't do it. My state of mind was so dark that the stories I wrote were becoming more and more evil. But in my heart, I was starting to hate this behavior as time passed. My heart broke just thinking about how Bucciarati would feel. I absolutely can't understand betrayal from a trusted friend, and this is why just thinking about it physically hurt me. Maybe Giorno would have had to kill Fugo then, and I'm sure that this would have given a really bad impression to my youngest readers. Araki explained further that at the time of writing part 5, he was hitting a personal rough patch in life due to 
certain personal matters. We aren't sure exactly what he was going through at the time, but we can guess it was fairly bad for his mental health, and he couldn't bear the idea of pitting his favorite characters against each other in the way he initially planned. Much like the fans, he viewed the main squad of Part 5 as a group of tight-knit friends, and possibly even a found family. Ditching this original plotline may not have been the best move narratively in the long run, but it was a move that Araki felt he personally needed to make, for himself, and for the readers that he feared would get the wrong sort of message from his work. Now, of course, you can hate the guy all you want for this decision, but at the end of the day, it's his story, and it's moments like these that show me that he needed Jojo just as much as his readers did. Okay, so at this point, you can probably understand that this series is getting longer and longer. We are around 50 pages into my overall script right now, and uh, if you didn't know, the script is ever-expanding. It's at 150 pages right now, but by the time I end this, it's probably going to be much longer. So, uh, I want to get this done within my lifetime, so uh, from now on, occasionally, there's going to be a guest narrator. Some of them will be professional grade A voice voice actors, some of them will be video essayists I found online that I really like the work of, and some of them are just gonna be a couple of my friends who wanted to jump in on the fun. This first one though, I'm really excited about for obvious reasons. Kira Buckland, the official English dub voice actor behind Stone Ocean's Jolene Cujo, was gracious enough to drop by and talk about some trivia on the next entry for me, while I get the chance to lay down. Yeah, bet you weren't expecting me to pull that out of my back pocket, huh? Or maybe you did. It's fairly well known online that Kira loves JoJo, so she was super down to be a part of this, which I massively appreciate, as you probably understand. Anyway, she'll be talking about the child version of Jolene from the Eyes of Heaven video game. Take it away, Kira. Like I said, I'm going to go lay down now. In the PS3 and PS4 JoJo video game, Eyes of Heaven, the story mode's ending features a new, original, but non-canon timeline with several changes that serve as fan service for the series itself. For example, fan-favorite characters who had previously died, like Noriaki Kakyoin, Mohamed Abdul, and Iggy, are still alive. Additionally, Will Zeppeli survives to the original fight with Dio, Caesar survives to fight with Joseph, Shigechi and Kosaku Kawajiri both survive to continue living in Morio, all members of Bucciarati's team survive to lead Passione with Giorno, and Jolene is shown together with Hermes, Emporio, Anasui, Weather Report, and Jotaro, who is getting on in age. It even shows off some small alterations to the end of Part 7 and 8 if you're fans of those as well. Most crucially, however, Jotaro finally decides to be a good dad for once, and ends up bringing a child Jolene to Morio during the events of Part 4, complete with her own unique model, design, and voice actor. This is the only time we ever get to see Jolene as a child, and although we never get to see her face in-game, it can actually be seen on the model when ripped from its data. My favorite thing about this scene in Eyes of Heaven with Kid Jolene and Morio is that it actually went on to inspire a lot of different fan works based on Jolene interacting with the Morio gang. Seeing a younger, happier version of Jolene interacting with her great uncle Josuke is just the most wholesome content I could ever ask for. We, we love to see it. Bow the Visitor While Araki is no stranger to creative ventures before and after JoJo, one of his most remembered nowadays is a manga called Bow. Published from 1984 to 1985, Bow was collected into two volumes and later adapted into a single episode OVA by Studio Periot in 1989. The series revolved around 17-year-old Ikoro Hashizawa, who is turned into the superhumanly strong bioweapon named Bao by the Dores Laboratory. Escaping with the help of a 9-year-old psychic girl named Sumire, he must fend off various assassins and monsters who are sent to kill him by Professor Kasuminome, Dores' head scientist who wants to stop the Bao virus from spreading and infecting the entire world. Quick fun fact I learned from the original Iceberg creator, Morgan, while writing this. The word Dores in Dores Laboratory is actually just the Japanese word for dress because they cover things up. Like how dresses, you know, clothes, cover things up. 
fucking genius. Bao's manga ended up getting licensed for a monthly chapter by chapter release in English by Viz Media in 1990, but sales were extremely low, taking until 1995 to be released in a collected graphic novel format. Likewise, the OVA was licensed for an English DVD release by Anime Ego in 2000 and would end up releasing in the following year. Series protagonist Ikaro would eventually find his way into the JoJo fighting game, All-Star Battle, as a DLC character in his bow form, and then he would end up being re-included in the definitive version of the game, All-Star Battle R, as a part of the base roster. Bao has also made a few cameo appearances in the JoJo anime as well. Like I talked about earlier on this iceberg, in the first episode of Battle Tendency, you can see a younger Joseph Joestar reading Bao on Speedwagon's plane in the flashback scene. Bao can also be spotted during one of the ending sequences for the Part 4 anime as a book on Rohan Kashibe's shelf. The funny thing is, if Bao were just a little more popular, we could have seen an earlier release of Jojo in the West too, as Viz was apparently considering that idea. They ran a blurb advertising it in their newsletter, but due to the flop of their release of Bao, such ambitions never materialized. You know what? Why don't we talk about that too? That's pretty important. For this next bit, I'm gonna hand over the mic to my co-writer Marcy, otherwise known as Nazumi VA. The Strange Adventures of Jojo as it turns out, JoJo's manga could have hit Western shores as early as 1990, and we have Bao to thank for that not being the case. You see, back when they were publishing single-issue translations of Bao, an author interview with Araki was published in the back of its first issue. In his author blurb, JoJo is mentioned under the name The Strange Adventures of JoJo, and this same title was again mentioned in their promotional newsletter at the time called Viz In. However, as previously mentioned, Bao did not sell very well for the company, which delayed its own release into a compiled volume for five whole years years. This effectively meant that the plan was shelved until further notice. The prospect did come back up again in 2002, with discussions starting up about potentially publishing JoJo as a monthly comic series, but these talks didn't last long either, as the market for monthly manga floppies, as they were then called, was in the midst of an obvious collapse at the time. Viz tried to hold on to this format for a while, with even some of their most promising titles like Neon Genesis Evangelion receiving similar treatment, but eventually they shifted all their priorities to volume releases, as they're generally known for today. And JoJo was first published under their banner in English in 2005 with the first volume release of Stardust Crusaders. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Re-Edited JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Re-Edited is, well, a re-edited version of the JoJo anime. It's a series of compilations that attempts to shorten the plots of parts 1 and 2 into three separate pseudo-films. Being released between the anime adaptations of Battle Tendency and Stardust Crusaders, it's probably safe to say that this was done in an attempt to lower the bar of entry a bit for the show. The stand era of JoJo is a lot more iconic overall than the Hamon era, and with part 3 on its way to the small screen, this highlight series was probably created to quickly catch people up who weren't interested in the first season but wanted to jump in for the latest one. While we have discussed before how JoJo parts can be enjoyed in isolation, despite being a kind of soft reboot, Part 3 in particular does expect viewers to have certain prior knowledge and context of past events. Many aspects in the series just don't hold the same narrative weight without a firm understanding of who Dio is or the crazy events of Part 2 that give Joseph's character far more depth than he would have otherwise. Also, I should clarify that this isn't me trying to shit on Phantom Blood or Battle Tendency for whatever reason. In fact, Part 2 is one of my favorite arcs in the entire series. I'm simply stating how this was probably the mindset behind making these compilations in the first place. The only place that you can legally watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure re-edited online, in the United States at least, is through the streaming service Crunchyroll. Upon discovering these for the first time a while ago, I was under the false impression that these things were made for Crunchyroll exclusively, like I'm sure many others were. But this is not the case. From what I've come to understand, this was an actual official release in Japan. And it even came in its own box set with plenty of extra features like exclusive radio interviews among other things. With how big of a deal this set seems to be, I'm sure you may be wondering if JoJo re-edited could function as a proper substitution for watching the original cut of the anime's first season. And to that I answer… probably not. At least for me personally, that's, that's what I think. 
While I myself have not watched the recut in full, judging by scattered fan reactions online, I would personally just recommend people watch the original show. Especially if they're first timers, like especially that. The re-edit cuts out nearly seven and a half hours of content from the original anime. And given that parts one and two are the shortest animated arcs of like all of them, that ends up accounting for a lot of shit. Plus, they already move the fastest story-wise compared to the rest of the series. I just don't personally see how you could cut it down even more without giving viewers constant whiplash. However, I can't control you and you can do whatever you want, I just want to make sure that that's clear. Though I will say that on the contrary, this could be a fun way to maybe re-watch the series for veteran fans, or maybe those who have already read the entire manga. Even I can admit that certain parts of Phantom Blood can definitely drag a bit on multiple viewings, so maybe a recut version of the show could make for a more interesting revisit if that's something that you're interested in. So in short, based on my opinion, for new people, I would just recommend watching the original show. For JoJo veterans like myself, maybe check this out. It might be something cool and new. Listen, all I'm trying to say is, is that this clearly is not no Snyder Cut, but hey, if it works, it works. I don't judge. Hey, next up, we got another guest entry, this time from Kaiser Neko of Team Four Star. He'll be talking about the well-known fan celebrations that were JoJo Fridays, or in specific, the It's Finally Friday meme format. JoJo Friday should be recognized as a national weekly holiday, and this meme is a testament to that. It's Finally Friday is a Stardust Crusaders meme that was first popularized on Tumblr, featuring a segment from the manga of Joseph, Polnareff, and Jotaro remarking on how the current day is Friday. Not to ruin the magic or anything, but the text present here is actually edited from the original page. The initial dialogue depicts the group reflecting on their long journey to Egypt, and even features Kakyoin and Avdol further down the page. Kinda sad our boys didn't get included here. The question is, for what purpose was the text edited? Well, that's where the Jojo Fridays come to play that I mentioned earlier. Back in my day, whenever a fresh new season of the Jojo anime was broadcast, episodes would premiere every Friday. We've all seen tons of people online getting hyped each week for episode drops, spreading the excitement for the legendary Jojo Fridays. Sadly, the meme has become a relic of its time, as Jojo is currently in the hands of Netflix, who releases a group of episodes in a batch-style format sporadically. Thankfully, even without its original context, the meme has been repurposed and remixed for other Friday-based events countless times, so I don't see its relevance fading anytime soon. Viva la Jojo Fridays! Forever in our hearts! Super Famicom Part 3 Game so far, we've talked about video games a lot on this iceberg, and no doubt we'll definitely talk about more in the future, but JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for the Super Famicom is a special case. This was the very first of its kind. You heard me right, this was the very first playable version of any JoJo property, and it was interesting to say the least. Releasing exclusively in Japan on March 5th of 1993, JoJo for the SNES was a full-fledged RPG adapting the plot of Part 3 Stardust Crusaders. I guess you could say it was a very bizarre RPG. I'm gonna put a bullet through my skull. From all the footage I've seen, it seems like this is a weird fusion of a few different genres of games, mainly a turn-based RPG with a point-and-click adventure game element. It's, it's, it's weird. It has some aspects of exploration, but it's also tied to a two-dimensional plane for movement, which makes it a bit confusing to get around and remember where your character is in a given level. The battles are fairly animated though, with each major character getting custom art and unique attacks, that fly right at the screen. I know that there were plenty of games with a similar battle system to this at the time, but the most direct comparison I can draw is to Earthbound, otherwise known as Mother 2, mostly because of the cinematic feeling of the black bars present at the top and the bottom of the screen. I don't know why, but when video games are put into a letterbox, uh, my, my monkey brain is just like, oh, oh cinematic! Something I found fairly unique is the talk option during battles. This command allows for a given character to say a line straight from the original manga, which either gives bonuses to your party or causes negative effects for the enemy. Also, and I love this, since the developers had to gamify aspects of Part 3's story, Jotaro needs to equip a special hat 
in order to properly stop time in battle. Yes, you have heard me correctly, Jotaro has a secret time-stopping hat. The World and Star Platinum are not similar stands, Jotaro just wears a cool hat and time stops. I mean, this whole thing is kind of an enigma already, I don't even know how this works. Where does his hat stop and his hair begin? I don't understand! Actually, you know what, getting a bit off track. Let's just get back to the game. Now, odds are, you may be curious as to why the gameplay on screen for a Japan-only game is transcribed in fluent English. And that's because in 2013, the game received a fan-made English patch, allowing Westerners to play it in full for the first time. The translation was created by retro game localizer Gideon G, and upon first writing the script, I had no idea who this guy was. But of course, this entire iceberg has led me down a research rabbit hole that I cannot escape from, so I looked into him. And I know it's not super directly related to JoJo, but I want to take a quick tangent to talk about this guy's work because it's super interesting to me. Gideon is proficient in the localization of video games, specifically classic titles, and is known for creating fan translations on the side of foreign retro games for his website, Aeon Genesis. Created in 1999 and still running to this very day, the site is a loose community of fans with a passion for games never released in English. As the creator of the page, Gideon has stuck with it for over 20 plus years as people have come and gone, and that's some serious dedication. And while his most recent update was in March of 2021, he's still on Twitter, he's still going strong, and I, I love it. So if you're a fan of niche game translations, I would definitely go over and check out AeonGenesis.net. It seems like this place is a hidden gold mine for that. However, just in case the site is down for whatever reason, I suggest following his Twitter as well, at Gideon G. And don't, don't fucking annoy him. I know that asking you guys to not do something is detrimental to what I want you to do, but just don't, don't fucking annoy people. I just want to reiterate, uh, I'm not being paid to say this or anything. He does not know who I am. I'm just a fan of people who work on stuff like this. I, I like it. Okay, now back to JoJo. Female Anasui and Character Redesigns Before we get into this, uh, I have to break a couple of things down just so that we get the full picture of this. There are many fans online that believe that Anasui, or Anastasia, was originally intended to be a female character. How do we know this? Was it revealed in some concept art or a Rocky interview? No, uh, he was literally introduced like this. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you may be able to point out some differences between the original design and the final one, but you know, just a few. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is no stranger when it comes to drastic redesigns of its cast throughout the original manga. One of the most infamous examples of this being the character Toshikazu Hazamata from Diamond is Unbreakable. Originally, Hazamata is shown to be of a height similar to that of other characters like Josuke and Okuyasu, as well as having a fairly normal looking school uniform. In contrast to this, his later design in the manga showcases him being much shorter than previously shown, with a shorter stature more akin to characters like Koichi Hirose. Additionally, his uniform now sports prominent belts and buckles strapped across his chest. It's never been made clear if this shift in design was intentional by Araki himself or just a natural alteration over time, but a few people have had some theories that it could be the former, that Araki intended this to be the case. Hi! Hi, yeah, uh, it's me. I- I'm People. Hazamata isn't alone in this change either. Another Part 4 character goes through a transformation in design that very much parallels him in more ways than one, Tamami Kobayashi. While he may have been introduced to the story before Hazamata, Tamami goes through the same change in design by the end of his initial storyline, from a tall build to a much shorter one. This shift in design goes unexplained, but I have a theory why this might happen due to how their stories and narrative both play out. Something we haven't talked about quite yet is how both of these characters are introduced. 
They both originate as intimidating antagonists at the start of each of their respective arcs, although by the end of the two, they've both been defeated and seemingly changed their dispositions entirely. By the end, they both become more reformed, and are staged as allies to the main protagonists going forward. Well, I mean, as close as you can call allies, Tamami is scared shitless of Koichi, but basically, they've seemingly changed in not just design, but their attitude and how they overall act. My guess is that not only were these drastic design changes intentional in the source material, but I think Araki drastically changed them visually to better reflect the directions of their characters. If that comes off a bit confusing, and I totally get if that's the case, let me further explain myself. We often gloss over it, but manga is not solely a written medium like a standard novel. It's also a visual one. I firmly believe that Araki didn't just overhaul these characters' looks entirely, but changed their designs to reflect the narrative progression of the story, their motivation, and how other characters now see them. At the start, he wanted them to look big and intimidating. They were positioned as antagonists. But after they were defeated and underwent significant development, they became allies. They stopped being scary, and he wanted their looks to reflect that. Now, they're smaller in size, make big, goofy faces, and, in general, seem a lot more likable to readers because of that. And in that way, I think Araki combines a sense of narrative progression that every story should have with a sort of visual progression. From bad to good, tall to short, these are the changes that are happening in both story and looks. That is why I think it's all on purpose. Now, it could be argued that this isn't the case and that this is just another example of Araki's art style developing over time, but with these two characters in particular, I don't quite believe that. Araki's art style has changed fairly drastically throughout his career, I'll give you that, but this development happened over years and years of writing. The change in these character designs happened within a single storyline, and in some cases, a couple of pages. The switch of these characters isn't artistic evolution, it's purposeful change. At least, that's my personal theory. And that brings us all the way back to Anasui. I know this might seem like a stretch, but I think his design change is indicative of something about his character, just like the others that I've just discussed. This isn't me assuming anything based on hearsay either. This might actually be confirmed by the creator himself for once. In 2019, Araki was invited as a guest to an event called Luca Comics and Games in Italy. It's one of the largest annual comic book and gaming conventions in the world, and Araki held a few interviews talking about himself, Jojo, and his personal interest in the country the convention took place in. It was during one of these interviews that Araki had officially addressed various fans' concerns about Anasui, with one person asking him directly, what was the reason you initially drew Anasui as a woman in Stone Ocean? His answer was very enlightening. Well, at the time, I wanted to portray a character with an androgynous image that went beyond the standard definition of genders, and thought that it'd be alright for a magazine aimed at boys. Yes, that's the image I had in my mind back then. I believe that the inclusion of this original design was purposeful, just like the others were. That this fluctuation between feminine and masculine traits was supposed to visually communicate the androgyny of his character in an immediate, obvious, and visual way instead of just through something more surface level, like a verbal description. This is even further backed up by Foo Fighters, as upon their introduction to him, they go on to question if Anasui is a man or not. Araki isn't just a writer, he's an artist, and he tries to use these obvious design differences to communicate details about a character beyond just words on a page. It seems that Araki wanted to confuse his readers just as much as Foo Fighters. And given that this is still a widely discussed topic in the fandom, I guess that he succeeded. Well, that or I could be reaching. You decide in the comments section below! Again, this is all my personal theory. It could be wrong, and I recognize that stuff like the anime directly conflicts with this viewpoint. Eventually, like we're all aware of by now, the manga was adapted into a made-for-TV anime by David Production. These sorts of design quirks were obviously not included. The designs used throughout were the more recent ones, uh, more consistent, and never changed. Though, I feel like this is more about TV 
TV production than it is about my theory's validity. Let me just quickly explain that. If you're familiar with the profession of art and animation, you may be aware of the practice of staying on model. This sort of thing is mostly done in animated film and television shows, and normally consists of the crew working on said project to keep the characters in it looking the same or similar throughout. It's all about holding a certain amount of consistency and always showing the characters on screen in the same way so that a viewer can clearly keep following along. A production will, most of the time, even create things called model sheets to help them better keep track of how all characters are supposed to look, not only in design, but the colors that they use too. Now, there are for sure exceptions to this rule, like the purposeful changing of the size and perspective of a given character to communicate something to the viewer. However, in reference to this, the concept of what is and isn't on purpose is something important to note. I think that during the development of the anime, these design aspects I've shown in the manga were seen as non-purposeful, and that they were, as I said, simply a natural evolution of Araki's art style and design aspects, instead of an important piece of visual information that he originally intended. David Production tends to pick out very specific styles of Araki's art to reproduce on screen when starting production on each new part of the show. I like this because it gives the show its own unique flavor compared to other anime of the same type. That's why in the anime, characters like Josuke always look the same, consistent throughout. While in the manga, the way he's drawn slowly changes over time with other characters as the way Araki draws changes naturally. Despite Hazamata having two clear designs, the team working on the show only went with what they thought was the definitive version, much like Josuke. This is a totally valid choice and works best for consistency, but if the change in design was done intentionally in the original source material like I've theorized, the anime adaptation is now lacking an aspect that is only unique to the manga. This same production method was applied to Anasui as well in the more recent Stone Ocean anime. Upon his first introduction, he is now sporting his more masculine look by default, instead of his more feminine version like in the manga. You wouldn't be wrong in assuming that Araki has a mostly limited input on certain aspects of the anime, but it was actually confirmed that he did offer up the idea of including the feminine appearance initially like in the original manga, but for some reason, David Pro didn't end up using it regardless. With that in mind especially, it does seem like it was a conscious choice for the crew to to not adapt this into the show, due to the fear that some viewers would probably be confused by the design change. Which, as much as it pains me to say, may have been the correct move, as I can very much see situations in which viewers might be confused as to the changes. In any case, Anasui is epic. Pledge allegiance to the flag, motherfucker! This entry contains spoilers for Part 6, Stone Ocean, so if you haven't seen the anime or read the manga, then skip to this timestamp here if you want to, you know, be unspoiled. Okay, we all good? We all good. Okay, let's get into this. Giorno in Part 6 some people theorize that Part 6, Stone Ocean, was supposed to have a completely different ending from what it would eventually end up becoming. It's unclear if this was ever supposed to be the case in actuality, but what is obvious is that many fans are desperate for it since the official ending to Stone Ocean was, you know, less than loved by the fanbase. I think that that's a trend with endings of JoJo parts. Either they hit 100% or they miss 100%. I, I feel like there's no in-between. This anticlimactic conclusion of Stone Ocean hit even harder since this would be one of the last times we ever saw the original JoJo continuity outside of a few spin-offs. Before Part 7 came out and rebooted the entire franchise, this wasn't just the ending of Stone Ocean. It was the ending of JoJo as we knew it. Some people believe that Part 6 had a bad reception at the time due to it having the first and only female protagonist in the entire series, and never mind it being a shonen, and that the decision to fully end JoJo was based off of that poor reception. But whenever people say that, it doesn't seem to actually be based in fact. There's there's no real proof that this was ever the case. In my humble opinion, I just kind of think that like, Araki just wanted to end it and move on, at least you know, at the time. 
But regardless, quite a few people hated the ending and attempted to cling on to whatever sort of alternative interpretation that they could, in a last-ditch effort to try and imagine what could have been. Giorno, being possibly included in Part 6, is one of those predicted interpretations. And there's even a bit of evidence that could support this being the case. During the publication of the original manga, various characters would get write-ups by Araki in the form of prison privilege cards scattered occasionally throughout volumes. These little text blurbs included interesting bonus information about the characters, but much like the stand wheels included in part 3 onward to showcase their stats, they were additional info and not needed to fully understand the story, simply there for just flair. The reason I bring them up in spite of this though, is that one edition seems to notably hint towards Giorno's potential inclusion. In the passage giving info on the stand user Raikiel, Giorno is mentioned by name near the end of the write-up. In particular, it references how, much like Raikiel, Giorno is also one of Dio's illegitimate children. Giorno Giovanna is also a son of Dio, but then why was he not drawn to the priest as well? This is a mystery, but perhaps he is already somewhere in Florida. It's extremely rare for Rocky to bring back or mention older characters in such a specific and direct way, especially when it comes to major plot points. In this case, how Dio's children seem to be drawn to Pucci, much like how stand users are drawn to other stand users. This bit of extra material can be interpreted in two separate ways. The most commonly held meaning behind its inclusion is that Giorno was indeed intended to appear during Stone Ocean's final act. This would have been very cool. And even if it hadn't affected the overall ending, it would have been awesome to see Giorno interacting directly with other protagonists like Jotaro and Jolene, among other things. Plus, having a fight between Made in Heaven and Gold Experience Requiem would have made my brain explode. The second interpretation of this text entry, and the far less exciting one, is that it was included as an explanation as to why Giorno wasn't around for the events of Stone Ocean. Over time, Araki has made it very clear that he doesn't like bringing back too many characters in future parts, unless they have direct ties to the story or could add to it in any significant and satisfactory way. While he may have wanted to expand more on Dio's legacy comparatively to the Joestars, he may not have been interested in including Giorno, either because Araki felt he didn't fit the story he wanted to tell, or that he was too overpowered to make for an interesting addition. Given the way that the text is worded, I'm more likely to believe that this interpretation was the case. The wording on it is just a bit too vague to make any sort of grand assumption. To me, this short explanation feels like just that an explanation as to why Giorno might not be around during these events. It kind of feels like Araki was aware of fan expectations at the time, and wanted to address them while still leaving the door open just a little bit. Anyway, now for something completely different. Another guest entry. If you're familiar with my channel at all, you'll know Mikey. He's a good friend of mine. He goes by Binjo Monkey. He's really cool. And for his subject, he is going to talk about Diesel. So hope you enjoy. Many of us are inspired by the things we love, and JoJo has never been an exception for many creatives. It's the reason why calling random things a JoJo reference has become such an ubiquitous meme in the first place, after all. However, sometimes the line between loving homage and strange plagiarism can become a bit fraught and blurry indeed. Nowhere else is this clearer than Diesel, an American comic book by Joe Welchens, published in April of 1997 by Antarctic Press. While this comic basically flew under the radar for the most part at the time, interest was reinvigorated when it was rediscovered in 2016, and found to be heavily influenced by JoJo's bizarre adventure. The plot revolves around lead character Thomas Tom Diesel, who uses his stand called Metahammer to fight his battles, one of which is with a blind blood-themed stand user, who locates his victims by sound. While a lot of details get mixed in, rearranged, or otherwise completely changed, it should be pretty obvious to anyone who's read or watched Part 3 that the whole thing is a loose adaptation of the Endul story arc. 
After receiving its boost in notoriety in 2016, a Reddit user named Rad Suit, who was familiar with the publisher, reached out to seek more information from the company's office manager, Doug Dlin. Dlin told Rad Suit that Diesel's author, Joe Welchens, had received a fan subbed copy of the original Stardust Crusaders OVA at some point, and was so impressed by the story that he wanted to introduce American readers to JoJo on a wider scale. However, because Antarctic would not be able to obtain the localization rights for the actual series, he worked on producing Diesel as an Americanized version of the story. This plan failed, leading to only a single issue of the potential series being published. Since then, Welchins eventually became editor-in-chief of Antarctic Press, and now also works as a colorist for Marvel Comics. Honestly, while Welchin's plan was kind of dubious to begin with, I can kind of see where he was coming from. If I watched a little bit of JoJo back then and I realized that it hadn't made its way to the States yet, I would try in any way possible to get that story over here for people to enjoy. I maybe wouldn't make a rip-off comic based on the story, but I would definitely want to spread the word about this really fun series. Thankfully though, as we all know with the massive anime boom over in America, this story would eventually make it to the West anyway. So thankfully, Diesel will always be this little fun footnote in the history of the series. Well, honestly, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it's definitely a footnote. Dad, you were never there for me growing up! Son? My name's Jeff! Dad! <laughs> Primo Mafioso The official English dub and localization of JoJo is known for its various changes of the source material when it comes to names. I talked about the practice in length during my part 1 retrospective, so I'll try not to repeat myself too much here, though usually these changes are in respect to the various musical references sprinkled throughout the show. Although the subject of this section isn't really related to that at all. In the original Japanese translation of part 5, Giorno iconically proclaims that he wants to become a gang star. You know, it's like a gangster, but but also a star. <laughs> <laughs> to my knowledge, it's never exactly been explained what a gang star is, but it sounds so stupid that I kind of love it. Other people agree with me on this because everyone has just sort of adopted the phrase like it makes sense and isn't just completely made up. However, when the English dub for Golden Wind was produced, the word gangstar was seemingly replaced by the term primo mafioso. I wouldn't blame you for thinking that this change was made to more correctly refer to what Giorno was trying to say and maybe to put a more accurate Italian spin on the phrase, but that isn't the case. Like, at all. According to several Italian-speaking fans, the term Primo Mafioso makes even less sense than the original and doesn't even work in Italian. So I'm unsure as to why this change was even necessary. I'll be real with you right now, I'm kinda sad they didn't just stick with Gangstar. Just because, you know, both terms make no sense at all, but Gangstar just sounds cooler. And based on the public outcry I've seen over this online, I think a lot of people agree with this. At the end of the day though, it don't matter. None, None of this matters. matters. Mobile Gacha Games so far, I've gotten the opportunity to talk about a good chunk of JoJo games for this iceberg. They've all been stuff that I think are super cool and encourage you to check out for yourself. These though, eh, I don't really care nearly as much for. Gotcha games! Everyone loves them, except me! I don't. They're mostly free video games that often revolve around digital collectibles, similar to that of a toy vending machine. The catch is that you can either use in-game currency to collect them or out of game currency, like your savings. They're video games aimed at slowly draining your wallet. Most of them are designed so that you're encouraged to pay actual money. Not all of them, but most. They can be very predatory to consumers, and if you don't believe me, most of the highest grossing mobile games are of this genre. So of course, with JoJo being as big of a brand as it is, it's had its fair share of gacha-based games. Three notable examples to be exact. 
all developed by Bandai Namco Entertainment, my mans. For this section, I'm gonna take a brief look at each of these games, but bear with me, I'm not too familiar on the format since I personally don't really enjoy it. I would normally tell you to avoid these like the plague if you plan on trying to save money, but one, they were never available in English speaking territories, and two, all three of them have had their servers shut down and are no longer available to play regardless. So in other words, you're safe for now. JoJo's Pitter Patter Pop. This was a puzzle game developed for smartphones and was released alongside the Part 5 anime adaptation in 2018. Despite having one of the dumbest fucking names of all time, JoJo's Pitter Patter Pop has one of the most unique and aesthetically pleasing art styles I've seen from a JoJo spinoff. While most games attempt to emulate the style of their source material, Pop goes in a completely different direction, instead opting for a more cutesy art style, and I think that's pretty neat. Given that JoJo tends to skew on a much more mature and dark tone, seeing all of these characters as chibis with a much more vibrant color color palette is pretty adorable. I also in general just really enjoy this interpretation, especially with the more simplified eyes and the proportions of the characters. Never before has a serial killer looked this adorable. No, 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 no. The basic gameplay revolves around matching tiles and that that's it just matching tiles there's some more to it than that obviously but there's only so much you can do to alter a tile matching game at its core honestly the best part about this thing's existence is that even if it isn't around anymore people were able to rip various art and assets from it and repost them online they mostly just represent characters and events from parts one through five but there's plenty there to look through a lot of these would make for some really great profile pictures or social media banners if you're interested, and they're just a simple Google search away. Also, for some reason, Dyer of all characters got unique art and animations here. I have no idea why he was included, but hey, Dyer fans, rejoice! The Thundercross split attack continues to be invincible! Thundercross split attack! <laughs> Stardust Shooters just like the previous, this was another free-to-play game developed for smart devices. However, unlike its contemporaries, it still currently maintains the title of the longest active JoJo mobile game, running for seven years. This game is JoJo, but with pogs! If you know what that means, then good for you, because I do not. I'll be honest, I don't really comprehend how this game plays. Even after I watched gameplay and read a description, I had a hard time understanding what I was even looking at. I'm probably just stupid and brain dead after writing so much for this video. I may not be the best person to cover this, but uh, I'm all you got right now, so I'll try my best. From what I can tell, the game is played by equipping medals based on characters from the series and just kind of bumping them into other ones and then you win. If that wasn't an adequate description, I'm sorry. Like I said, this script has been insane. It's over 100 pages at this point, and I very much want to go home and see my family. Not much is too interesting about this, but again, probably the best thing about this game post-mortem is the sheer amount of high-quality JoJo art it spawned. A lot of it is reused assets from other games and manga, but damn that key art do be looking fine as hell. Look at those colors and shading, man. Jesus. Oh wait, no, sorry, not you, Jesus. I didn't mean to, you, you know what, forget it. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond Records. This is probably the most interesting entry on this brief list. Releasing in 2017, this was a free mobile game that focused on 3D action style gameplay and featured content from the first five parts of JoJo. Diamond Records, at least for a mobile game, was fairly impressive on both a visual standpoint and gameplay wise. It originally focused on a sort of free roam beat em up style of gameplay wherein you could team up with your favorite characters for various quests and objectives on a variety of levels. I actually remember the buzz surrounding the community when it was first coming out, crossing my fingers and somehow hoping that it gets released in the West. Spoiler alert, it did not. I am in constant pain. 
And sadly, I would never get the chance to even try out the game because a year later, Bandai Namco made this baffling decision to completely change everything about the game? I'm not exaggerating here, they... They actually did this. In one of the strangest gameplay updates I've ever seen a video game undergo, in 2018, Diamond Records got a massive overhaul entitled Diamond Records Reversal. This wasn't just a content edition or a small update. This was a complete makeover of the base game. Instead of the free roam combat that many players had enjoyed, everything was now constricted to simplistic turn-based RPG fights. The entire way the game functioned was now totally different, and while progress was transferred over, many character stats and balancing with the new way the game functioned was jank as fuck and people hated it. Just to clarify for a second, I'm not saying that turn-based fights are necessarily bad, I'm just saying that when you buy Minecraft, you don't want to play Pokemon. This is not what people signed up for when they first started playing, and what's worse is that the free roam beat em up style game that they actually wanted no longer existed. Instead of making a different game, Bandai Namco just completely changed an existing one, and because of that, Diamond Records went on a downward spiral that eventually ended up killing it. In 2019, it was announced that the game's servers would eventually close down for good, and later that year, they did just that. I have no earthly idea why Bandai Namco thought this was a good idea, but some have labeled it as a quick cash grab, knowing that the new mechanics of the game would push players further to spend more money on it since the original version of the game wasn't profitable enough as it was. Honestly, one of the sadder endings to one of these games. Though it is worthy of noting, it does seem like there's a fan-made revival in the works that is fittingly called Diamond Records Revival. Currently, you can find a download to the demo of it on itch.io. I played a bit of it on my own time, and while it's a bit rough around the edges and I'm unsure how it stacks up to the original, I'm glad that a project like this exists at all, and I'm always down to support fan efforts like it. It hasn't received any updates in a while, so the creator may have moved on to other things, but if you like what you see, I would check it out. Link can be found in the doobly-doo like all the other stuff I've been linking. Lost Phantom Blood Movie. Strap in folks, because this one is pretty iconic. As has already been mentioned on other parts of this sprawling web of JoJo trivia, Studio APPP once made an OVA series based on part 3 of JoJo, Stardust Crusaders. This was the only actual anime adaptation of JoJo Media, barring some promotional commercials, until the modern anime adaptation by David Production, which would go on to start later in 2012. But did you know that there were actually plans to bring the origins of JoJo to the silver screen, far before that of the television screen? Yep, it's true. After fully completing their strangely selective Stardust Crusaders adaptation, Studio APPP set their eyes on the earliest part of JoJo history, Part 1 Phantom Blood. You see, because they had capitalized on the crown jewel of JoJo only a year after its manga run had ended, transitioning into Part 4, they had been seeing some massive success with their OVAs. And that was an encouraging sign that perhaps they could keep the gravy train flowing if they dug into Araki's crazy well a little deeper. And so, in 2007, the Phantom Blood movie was born. Produced as a part of a commemoration for Araki's 25th year of creating manga, it was given a limited Japanese theatrical release starting on February 17th of 2007. Co-produced by Bandai, production took around three whole years, and even featured an original theme song titled Voodoo Kingdom, written by the band Sold Out. You may even recognize the band's MC, Diggy Mo, as the singer of the popular third ending song to the original Soul Eater anime, Bakuso Yumeta. In an interesting case, this Soul Eater track, as well as other music produced by Sold Out, would later go on to be reused in popular fan-made JoJo MAD projects that have made the rounds online. 
To clarify for those unaware, MAD videos are similar to that of AMVs, but instead of using anime as an editing source, MADs instead usually use multimedia content, like manga and other things. Typically, MADs are more so made by Japanese fans and generally originate from the Japanese website Nico Nico Doga. This series of JoJo MADs I'm showcasing here were actually some of the stuff that got me into reading the manga. They're insanely well edited, and I've seen them reposted and shared around a lot, so they're pretty easy to find with a simple YouTube search. What's not so easy to find, however, is the Phantom Blood movie. Yeah, sorry, I got a bit off track there, but hey, we found our way back around. Honestly, a lot of these iceberg subjects are just kind of blurring together for me at this point. So yeah, the film. <clears throat> You see, despite the monumental amount of work put into the Phantom Blood movie, with production materials and advertisements still littering the annals of web history, if you go digging, the film itself was never released officially or unofficially after its initial run in Japanese theaters. It never even hit home video, and the circumstances surrounding this gap in animated JoJo history are frightfully vague, effectively making it lost media. Void century looking ass. There is a surprisingly scarce amount of footage of this thing available online, even this many years later. There is one major notable instance where people stumbled across some footage, but even then it wasn't much. An actual work print of the film's first 16 minutes was used as course material for a sound design project at the Academy of Art University at some point in time, and was provided to the class by the film's composer. This work print only featured music and no voice acting. This was because, as I said, it had been used for educational purposes, with the students having to add their own sound design as a class project. The reason that we even know about this is that one student who was a part of the class had uploaded their completed assignment to YouTube in 2012, making this the first glimpse of the film that people have had since its theatrical release. Since then, we've gotten a couple of sporadic pieces of footage that have leaked online over the years in form of short clips and trailers, but that's really been it. Despite our inability to watch the film, however, many of its differences when compared to its source material have thankfully been thoroughly documented. And honestly, they're interesting to say the least. I say interesting a lot in this script, but I, I just, I have no other words to describe these things. So for the sake of being thorough, let's go over them in short order. Dio's inner monologue is never shown, so his motives for bullying Jonathan are never clearly conveyed to the audience. The boxing match between Jonathan and Dio, their shared rugby game, and Jonathan's first encounter with his sweetheart, Arena Pendleton, are all omitted. Two extra scenes are added, one where Dio steps on Jonathan's necklace from Arena, and another where Jonathan hurts himself on a needle Dio places in his bed. There's also a weird bit of added dialogue where Dio asks Arena if she's done it with Jonathan yet. Doing it obviously being a euphemism for, well, uh... Sex! What? Sex! Ah! Ah! So yeah, let's move on. The concept of Hamon is not really explained, and is instead just treated as fighting energy to level up Jonathan's punches. Not much else is really explained further. Okay, now I'm gonna need you to be sitting down for this next one because it's devastating. The entire character of Robert E.O. Speedwagon is omitted. That's right, our boy Speedweed is completely absent from the plot. Literal revisionist history in motion. Now, to clarify, this isn't to say that he's removed from the movie entirely. He actually still seems to appear in the Ogre Street scene to fight Jonathan, as this scene was shown off in one of the trailers in a very, very brief clip. But apparently, outside of this scene, dude is just kinda gone. He's not really a part of the main story, and that sucks. Honestly, with that in mind, I can totally understand why this is lost media, because who the fuck cares? Bring us the beefcake, or don't fucking show up. Jonathan's fight with Jack the Ripper is omitted. Dio uses his vampire powers to somehow transform his hideout in Wind Knight's lot into a giant castle. O okay then. Dio does not show up to the graveyard to instruct Bruford and Tarkus. 
The scene where Bruford gives his sword to Jonathan and names it Luck and then Pluck is omitted. While the character of Tom Petty still appears, Poco, Dyer, and Straitso are all absent. Given Straitso's importance later on in Part 2 alongside Speedwagon, it's unclear how they would have handled a Battle Tendency adaptation if that ever came to be. Tom Petty's flashback with Zapelli now takes place on a cliff, not a tightrope over the Tibetan Temple. When Tom Petty reads Zapelli's future, it causes a shockwave that blows away the clouds. The scene where Jonathan and Zapelli clash with Dio under the moon takes place after the fights with the Dark Knights instead of before, and is instead now near Dio's castle. The famous how many breads have you eaten in your entire life line is omitted. Zeppeli is killed similarly to how Dyer is killed in the manga and by Dio instead of Tarkus. Zeppeli's hair does not change color when he gives his energy to Jonathan. Jonathan does not light his gloves on fire to fight Dio's freezing technique, but rather powers up to win. The ship that Jonathan and Arena board at the end of the part sails through the Pacific Ocean instead of the Atlantic Ocean, but despite this, Arena is still somehow rescued near the Canary Islands. The baby, Elizabeth, is omitted from the movie, and Arena also enters the coffin without Jonathan saying a single word to persuade her. This omission would have also greatly impacted the story of Battle Tendency if it were ever adapted by the same team. And that pretty much wraps up all the major differences between the film and the manga. I know I said my piece on it earlier, but despite Speedwagon's absence from the movie, the characters of Dario and Wang Chan respectively were actually played by a comedy duo named Speedwagon, composed of Jun Adota and Kazuhiro Ozawa. So in a way, I guess indirectly, Speedwagon is at least referenced in some small, small fashion. And you know, that's great and all, but this production is still on thin fucking ice. Also, I had no place to bring this up during my talk, so I figure I could just bring it up here. I think the poster for the film has a bit of an error. The pose that Jonathan strikes besides Dio here is actually modeled after one of Joseph's poses from Battle Tendency, and I'm unsure why. Specifically, it's the pose present on the cover of the manga's 8th volume. I don't really know if this was done on purpose or not, but it could easily be a mistake given that Jonathan and Joseph are the most similar looking JoJo's design-wise. And I'll be honest, I also made the mistake of mixing the two up once or twice. Due to the very nature and history of this film, it's possible that it might never fully resurface. However, that hasn't stopped people from continuing the search, and even attempting to partially reconstruct it based on footage that has already appeared online. I found this project while I was searching for footage for this section. A couple of years ago, I even tried my hand at doing some English voiceover for one of the leaked scenes. Since a majority of the currently released footage doesn't contain any voice acting and we don't have any semblance of a script, I tried to make my own by referencing both the manga and the modern anime for dialogue. If you want to check it out for whatever reason, you can still pretty easily find it on my channel, but I'll also have it linked properly in the description. My voice acting has definitely aged a bit on this video, but I'm still pretty proud of what I was able to do at the time, especially when coming up with dialogue to match the animation. Hey! Hey! What was that for? <laughs> Danny! Many rumors have circulated about this movie since its tumultuous history was properly documented, with many claiming that the reason it was never released to home video was because Araki himself hated the film. However, no evidence of such a thing being the case actually exists, and it's largely believed to simply be a rumor and nothing more. At some point, I'd like to dive into a more in-depth video essay talking about the movie and its history in specific, so if that's ever something you'd like to see from me, by all means, let me know in the comments on this video or on Twitter. Whether we will ever get to see the Phantom Blood movie resurface in the future is one of the JoJo community's greatest mysteries, and for now, it remains unsolved. I have always wanted to say that, oh my god.
Anyway, uh, I'm gonna go lay down a bit, so uh, here's Marcy to talk about the next entry. Seventh Stand User Jojo and video games are obviously no stranger to each other, but did you know that the same is true of fan games? The Seventh Stand User is a game made in RPG Maker 2000 that proves just that. Developed by Clayman and released in 2014 on Mediafire via the project's official Tumblr, the Seventh Stand User is heavily based on the events of Part 3, Stardust Crusaders, and allows the player to take control of a new original character. Upon starting the game, you're assigned one of 18 different stands by a mysterious figure named Steel, based on your answers to a personality quiz given to you at the start of the game. From there on, you either join or don't join the Stardust Crusaders in their journey to Egypt to kill Dio. While the game largely follows the source material at first, events will diverge based on your decisions, either for better or worse. While the plot is pretty faithful to the original manga, a lot of things get tossed around in the mix or rearranged, like the role of the Oingo Boingo brothers being greatly reduced, a playable Josuke from Part 4, and an enigmatic terrorist group called the Slaves to Fate. Like many RPGs, the game also has several different endings, with some of them being happier than others. The game contains plenty of other JoJo cameos, fun references, or shoutouts to other things like Final Fantasy or Romancing Saga, and even the opportunity to pull a triple betrayal at the end if you've gotten enough bad karma. There's a lot of experimentation to do here, which is honestly a lot of fun. A fan-made sequel to this fan-made game is also being developed with Clayman's approval, titled The Seventh Stand User 2, Fate is Unbreakable, which will apparently feature the cousin of the first game's protagonist and go through the event of Jojo Part 4. Part 5 Alternate Ending It's no secret that, for a lot of folks, the ending of Part 5 was a bit contentious. Not only was the final battle and new stand powers introduced the definition of a deus ex machina, but its final moments were certainly much less of a clear-cut conclusion than any other part had received up until that point. And if I could pick a word for it, it would probably be abrupt. Much of the ending felt like it was up to interpretation, which is fine, but not really my cup of tea. Though, of course, where any debate rages concerning the ending of Something Beloved, many people will give their own takes on what they would have preferred the ending to be like. Some think it just needs that extra bit of spice and flair. But if you think I'm gonna spend time talking about and dissecting well-crafted alternate endings to this story, you must not know me at this point, because instead, we're gonna be talking about one of the most infamous ones. We're talking about this fan-made, non-canon manga page that features features Dio Brando, who is inexplicably resurrected, saving his half-son Giorno during his final battle with Diavolo. It's insane. <laughs> I legit can't tell if it was made in complete sincerity or if it was more of an absurdist joke, but that hasn't stopped people from latching onto it super hard. For some reason, even Diavolo seems to know who Dio is. Which of course is… interesting. There's a lot to unpack here lore-wise. I'll be honest, hunting down the proper source for this was really difficult. However, I do know for a fact that it was drawn around nine years ago at the very least, and I think it was drawn by a Japanese fan overseas. The only reason I say that is I'm pretty sure when I first saw this image years ago, the text bubble at the bottom was written originally in Japanese. But for one reason or another, I can no longer find that version. Don't quote me on that, going off of my currently dying brain cells, so yeah. Something I also discovered is that the entire piece is actually a direct reference to this scene from Part 6 of Stone Ocean. Initially, this went totally over my head, I never put two and two together. In retrospect, I feel very stupid. Another thing I learned is that this fan interpretation, despite how hilarious you may find it like I do, is actually surprisingly popular. This source image here is actually the most niche part of its reach. People have recreated it in fan fan art, anime edits, and even full 3D animations, all of which have a far greater reach than the original artwork, and getting tens of millions of views in total. I'd be pretty shocked if a lot of these didn't end up somehow fooling newer fans of the series in some way. Back when I had first started reading JoJo, even I had to do a double take when I saw this manga version for the first time. At first glance, I was very confused. The fascination that the internet has over this sort of thing isn't unfounded. It's a pretty popular opinion that people felt that Giorno's connection to Dio was pretty cool in theory, but 
very lacking in practice, Araki didn't really do much with the two's relation in part 5, and we have no idea how Giorno owns a photo of Dio or what Giorno even knows about his father whatsoever. He must have some sort of sentimentality to keep that picture of him in his wallet, but that sort of thing was just never explored or even briefly explained. You can very much tell that it was something that Araki just didn't really want to focus on, but that just made it all the more interesting to his readers. It's just another case of Araki more so focusing on his newer ideas for stories rather than connecting them with the past. You could perceive this as kind of lame, but it's because of choices like this that the JoJo fanbase can just run wild with speculation and theories. Maybe that was even his intent, keeping stuff vague to generate more interest in a new character. I don't know. You can never really gauge where Araki's head is at with his stuff, and I've grown to really enjoy that. Jonathan Abused Animals While it is true that Dio is the one that is most well known for putting poor Danny Joestar through torment, having literally burned him alive, did you know that our pure boy Jonathan isn't without his own criminal record in the world of animal mishandling? Why did that sound like a Dora the Explorer episode? Did you know that our pure boy Jonathan isn't without his own criminal record in the world of animal mishandling? Good! Yes indeed, in the original Phantom Blood manga, we get to see a bit of their budding relationship when Jonathan was just 5 years old, relayed to the audience in the form of a conversation his father George is having with Dio. When Jonathan first approached the dog after George bought him as a puppy, Danny was still afraid of unfamiliar places and people, causing him to then bite Jonathan on the arm. Feeling slighted by this, Jonathan took to antagonizing the poor dog by throwing rocks at him and chasing him around with a broom. However, this antagonism abruptly ended one day when Jonathan was swimming in a river and began drowning. At which point, Danny rushed into the river and saved his life, making them the best of friends ever since. While it does end as a sweet story, I can't get over how Jonathan threw rocks at a puppy? That, sir, is not gentlemanlike at all. In fact, it is very bad. While the revisionist history of the anime paints over Jonathan's crimes, it's good to know that they at least made up in the end. You know, before Danny was set on fire, of course, a and then and then he dies. Fan-made openings and trailers. Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover, so strap in. Just like with any popular series, JoJo has a lot of fan-animated content online. Quite honestly, an absurd amount. And not just amateur stuff either, like insanely high quality stuff, many of which was posted before and after the anime existed. I think that we tend to forget how long this series has been being published. Most Western fans only came to discover it because of the start of the anime adaptation in 2012, but the original manga itself has been running since 1987. Compared to its contemporaries like Dragon Ball and Fist of the North Star, JoJo had gotten a proper anime remarkably late into its lifespan. And while I do think it ended up being a good thing because of how amazing it turned out, many were craving a proper anime animated version all throughout those long years of silence. It's because of that longing that fans would then take it upon themselves to just make it themselves. Obviously, no one team of fans can make an entire production, but what they could do was start small. In an attempt to conceptualize what a JoJo anime could look like and show their love for the series, the practice of creating fan-made openings and trailers became popular online. A lot of these were originally posted to Nico Nico Doga since a majority of the fanbase was still focused primarily in Japan, but of course, much like other stuff on this iceberg, English-speaking fans would fill in the gaps and repost these projects to YouTube so more people could easily access and watch them. For some, these videos were their introduction to JoJo as a whole, and would eventually be what would start them down the horrific spiral of becoming a fan of this insane manga. Even all these years later, with a thriving anime adaptation, this practice is still quite common. With six parts of the series animated as of the making of this video, plenty are still clamoring to see what a full production of Steel Ball Run in Jojolian would look like with the same treatment. Spoiler, it looks really cool. 
and sometimes people will just remake the official anime openings in their own style or in completely new ways, whether that be reanimating them in full or adding a bunch of new characters as a sort of celebration of the official team coming this far production-wise. I've even seen people animating JoJo characters into already existing openings for other anime. So much ground has been covered with this stuff, it's wild. The amount of passion people have for these projects is unrivaled. I'll have a proper playlist of a bunch of them linked in the description below alongside a bunch of other stuff that you can check out. When I first got into JoJo's, I watched these fan videos all the time. They're so cool. I love fan content like this. I, I love it so much. I've been so obsessed in the past that I even ended up actively participating in some of them, specifically as a voice actor. It's not too often that I get to tie myself into this iceberg, but it's true. I did voice work for a couple of these animations. Most notably, I was a voice actor in the fan-made Steel Ball Run trailer created by Jax in 2016. Given its view count nowadays, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have seen this before. It made a big splash when it first came out. I thought I was hot shit at the time because of it. <laughs> Believe it or not, but in the trailer, I voiced Johnny Joestar, which at the time was really fun and really cool. However, <laughs> oh my god, it is, <laughs> hmm, it is not that good. Well, okay, maybe some of the bits are like, pretty good. Like, some of the narration at the beginning, I still dig a lot. I think I did a pretty good job, but damn, dude, some of this stuff is bad. <laughs> In particular, the lines I recorded for the stand rush near the end with Tusk don't sound like the standard Aura Aura type thing. It just kind of sounds like I'm gurgling for some reason. You know, initially I got really excited that I'd be able to talk about my inclusion in this particular topic, but now feeling a lot of cringe at the moment. <laughs> Hardcore fan. Welcome to Tier 5, baby! We're finally getting to the more obscure stuff. If you know any of these, you can very much consider yourself a hardcore fan. And just like any hardcore JoJo head, your friends are probably gonna start to hate you. Welcome to the club! George Joestar George Joestar is a side story light novel written and illustrated by Otaro Maijo, who has a lot of popular written works with the Japanese publishing company Kodansha. In fact, one of his most popular short stories was translated into English as a part of Del Rey's Faust anthology, the title of which was Drill Hole in the Brain, which, you know, is neat and uh, not at all concerning whatsoever. Most sane author I know. George Joestar was released for the series' 25th anniversary on September 19th of 2012, but a paperback with some minor changes was released later in December of 2017. Although the cover has an illustration by Araki himself, this is largely considered non-canon by the fandom at large, especially due to how completely bonkers it gets in its second plotline, mixing and mashing things from all across the first seven parts, seemingly with no rhyme, reason, or worry of appearing coherent whatsoever. What I'm trying to say is that it, it, it's, it's, it's strange. It's, it's very strange. It's beyond bizarre. <laughs> Tons of weird retcons and returning characters make appearances here, and that sort of thing is mostly what people remember this book for. The book's story is divided into two alternating plot lines, one of which follows a younger George Joestar II, who you may know as Joseph's father from the main series, while the other story instead follows a teenage detective from an alternate universe also named George Joestar, this time with a J instead of a G. This George is trying to solve a murder mystery in Morio, leading him to hop around universes and meeting several stand users along the way. Yeah, when I told you the second plotline was weird, I meant it. I don't lie or exaggerate anything. I never, never have in my entire life. This book also introduces new stands named after films and TV shows instead of songs or musical groups, and also introduces four new stand-like phenomena which are apparently not stands, but act like them kinda? I'm now going to try to attempt to explain these without having read the entire novel, so uh, 
strap the fuck in. First off, there's an ability called wounds. These are the result of repeated trauma to the mind and body. They operate similarly to stands, but instead in a sort of uncontrollable berserker state, which works seemingly on its own to stop the user's pain as soon as possible and by any means necessary. Second, there's bounds. Bounds allow their user to merge with an element or environment and freely manipulate it. Surprisingly, this is the most normal type of ability of the four. Third, we have beyonds, which, get this, is a metafictional concept tantamount to the author of the story itself choosing heroes and being able to control their destiny if those heroes believe in it. Okay, I don't think I've ever heard of an author self-inserting themselves as a power set in their story, but okay. <laughs> And finally, there's the aptly named Mass Hysteria, which, similar to the real-life concept, affects people on a collective level through their anxiety or fear. Of course, since this is JoJo, instead of simply being a shared hallucinatory state or delusion, it quite literally manifests their collective imagination or emotions as weird mystery creatures which perpetuate the anxiety over their existence simply by existing. It's kind of like a feedback loop of anxiety that continuously allows them to exist. And before you start thinking about it too hard, listen, you're just, it's, it's not gonna make sense. As you might have noticed, this book is weird, even by JoJo standards. It often calls attention to the fact, in very plot-significant ways, that it is a work of fiction, and even references Maijo's other written works with similar themes a lot. It feels like an out-of-control fanfiction that's technically official. George Joestar has even been referenced in the video game All-Star Battle in a mirror match of Cars against himself. If fighting himself in a match, Cars will quote the parallel version of himself from the book's 16th chapter, saying, I am alive. My body didn't die, but my life is just as weak and fragile as before. My Joe hasn't forgotten about his work on George Joestar either, having just recently drawn new artwork of the characters from it in November of 2020. If there's ever been one piece of spin-off material I need to read at some point, it's George Joestar. The more and more I learn about this thing, the crazier it gets. Just remember everybody, if you think that JoJo is bizarre now, it can always, always get crazier. Oh, oh, it seems like we got another guest entry. It couldn't possibly be Bumbles McFumbles from YouTube.com. <gasps> Holy fuck! Bumbles McFumbles from YouTube.com? I wonder what entry he'll talk about. Maybe he'll talk about the entry Smith. Yeah, he's gonna talk about a character named Smith. In part five, the stand of Narancia Girga is a remote controlled fighter plane called Aerosmith. But all good planes need equally talented pilots, right? Apparently, according to Araki himself from a Q&A in Weekly Shonen Jump, Aerosmith does in fact have a pilot sitting inside of its cockpit, albeit a really tiny one. His name, as given by Araki, is Smith, and he can actually be seen silhouetted in the plane in several close-up shots of Aerosmith itself. It can't be an easy job, the one he does, and frankly, he deserves a raise after having to deal with Formaggio. But alas, there's no workers' union for stands yet. Yet. Giorno was originally female. The title says it all. Originally, Giorno Giovanna, the main protagonist of Part 5 Golden Wind, was intended to be a girl instead of a boy. This wild behind-the-scenes info was revealed in a recent interview with Hiroshi Sakia, who is notable for being Araki's editor during Part 5's early development. At the time, it was unheard of for the protagonist of a shonen manga to be a woman, and it was due to this stigma that Sakia dissuaded Araki away from his original idea. In an interview, a few characteristics of Giorno are further pointed out to be potential leftovers from the scrap concept. The first and most obvious being that Giorno's Japanese name, Haruno Shiobana, is actually a feminine name, and the second one being that of Giorno's stand ability. With gold experience, Giorno can give life to inanimate objects. Sakia noted that this is similar to that of giving birth to something, like a mother. Araki jokingly tossed around the idea that he could potentially write in a twist where Giorno is revealed to secretly be a woman all along, only having looked masculine in character, but again, this was presented to Sakia as more of a joke 
joke. We all know, however, that this issue with a main character would not stay the case permanently, as in the end, Rocky would finally get his wish for a female protagonist with Jolene Cujo in Stone Ocean. You know what, listener, you've been really good during this entire video. I'm gonna give you a treat with another guest entry. That's right, another person will be talking instead of me once again. That's right, for this next entry, we have Humble Squid, otherwise known as H Squid or H Squid Reviews, talking about a curious post office scene that only appears in the manga. Post office scene in part two. In chapter 83 of the original manga, in the middle of part 2, Joseph and Caesar visit a post office together to search for the Red Stone of Asia, which had been mailed away by ECDC as he was possessing Susie Q a chapter prior. They plead with the mailman to search for the package the stone is in and not to mail it out, but he refuses on the basis that it's against the law. This leads to a goofy slapstick scene where Joseph keeps threatening to beat him up, but stops just in time when any other employees look that way. When they're at their wit's end trying to convince the guy, Caesar just straight up decides to try and steal the package, claiming that the mail is a service for the people and the receiver of this package isn't human. Which is a hilarious thing to say. Before he can layeth the smackdown on the guy, however, Messina arrives just in time to inform the two that Lisa Lisa has used her Haman hypnotism on Susie Q, getting the address of the package in the process, enabling them to head directly directly to it. In the anime adaptation by David Production, this scene is entirely omitted, instead replaced with a scene of Lisa Lisa using her hypnotism right away while Joseph and Caesar are still in the same room, eliminating the need for them to even go to the post office in the first place. I say this for all of the guest narrators, but please be sure to check them out. I have their links in the description and everything. H Squid doesn't really talk about JoJo stuff, but he talks a lot about comics and like Sonic lore. So check that out. I, I love Sonic, so th that's right up my alley. ALS Challenge. For many creators, social media is a large part of their day-to-day -day interactions with and for fans of their work. Although uh, Rocky is a little different though. He doesn't really have much of a social media presence at all, except for one little footnote in history that might go unnoticed by most. The only time a Rocky has ever posted publicly on social media was a video on YouTube, uploaded to a channel tailor-made specifically for this one upload. The video itself isn't as interesting as I may have made it seem, it's just a Rocky himself doing the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, which was a social media challenge where someone either poured a bucket of ice water over their own head or had it done by someone else. This trend was popular during 2014 and was done for the sake of promoting awareness of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as ALS, motor neuron disease, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And of course, it was done to also encourage donations and awareness to its medical research. In the video, Araki walks briefly through a wooded area before having water dumped on his head and then proceeding to take a cool drink from his glass that he has with him outside. Waldo in Part 3 in chapter 251 of the manga, towards the end of part 3, Dio threatens a senator named Wilson Phillips in order to get a ride in his limousine. At first, he tries to decline, but then he gets his front teeth ripped out by Dio, uh, after which he obviously agrees. Dio orders him to drive on the sidewalk, and when he points out that people are in the way and are going to be hit, Dio orders him to keep going, after which he basically spirals into a frenzy and mows down a giant crowd. In the crowd shot of citizens flying as the limo slams into them, the ever popular Waldo from Where's Waldo fame can be seen in the background as an easter egg. I can only assume that all future appearances of Waldo in any given media were handed down to his son, as this is obviously where the original Waldo's life tragically ended. We'll miss you Waldo. Friend. Uh-oh, it's it's time once again for more guest entries. For this one, we got a really cool guest in Viva Reverie. Viva Viva Rev Viva Revier Viva Revieri Viva Rev I've never said her username out loud and now I feel like a jackass. Anyway, she's super cool and super nice and works on the Really Really Fast series, which you may have seen floating around on the interwebs. It's covered JoJo quite a lot. And now she will really, really fast cover something for my iceberg. Thanks, thanks for the help, Viva. Anel Dr. 
In the early days of pre-anime Jojo fandom, a popular reaction image and meme was a panel of the villain Enel from One Piece, traced over to look like Dio in part 3 instead. The expression is one of comically goofy, shocking surprise, and is originally a large reaction panel of the previously stoic, smug, and poised Enel, realizing that, due to the fact that the series protagonist Monkey D. Luffy is made of rubber, he cannot be affected by Enel's frankly OP powers to control and wield lightning in battle. Jojo Lion The name of the eighth part of Jojo's manga is titled Jojolion, but for a long while we didn't have much of a clear picture of who the main antagonist would be, or even if we had seen them yet. This led to some humorous theory crafting that the answer had secretly been under our noses this entire time, hidden in plain sight within the title that the true villain of Part 8 is really the Jojo Lion. But no, obviously not really. It's just a meme, although memes of this variety have been oddly prophetic before. So honestly, who knows? Maybe when the Jojo Lion makes its grand debut in Part 9, we'll all be laughing and years later realize just how foolish we all had been. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll never happen. I, I, I don't know. I don't care. I don't know why I even brought this one up. <laughs> this is the weirdest entry on here. Whole Horse was going to replace Avdol. For a long while, rumors have circulated claiming that Whole Horse was initially intended to replace Avdol on the main team of Stardust Crusaders, after the latter of which was seemingly killed off in Part 3. The rumor also stated that these plans were then thwarted when Araki's then-editor at the time suggested that Avdol should be brought back due to his popularity among readers. This is an interesting tall tale, but uh, sorry to burst everyone's bubbles, it's very much not true. Well, I mean, partly not true. Araki did consider adding Whole Horse to the central cast. He said so in an interview as a part of the Jojonium release of the manga. In it, he says, I had planned from the beginning to have Kakyoin and Polnareff switch allegiances away from Dio to join the group. But I didn't plan this for Whole Horse. However, I don't think it would have been such a bad idea to have him join. I drew him on a color title page like he was a part of the crew, and I had him show up multiple times after his first appearance. However, my conclusion was that he would throw off the balance of the group if he were to join. As far as his character is concerned, both his looks and personality overlap somewhat with Polnareff, and I felt that it would be difficult to work in his emperor stand as an ally. As Araki said, Whole Horse was one of the only characters he considered adding to the Crusaders that wasn't already planned out in advance, so this caused issues the more he thought about what his role would provide narratively. Whole Horse was originally written as just an enemy stand user, and because of this, his abilities weren't created with clear enough limitations. His stand, the Emperor, materialized as a gun that had no restrictions on its firing rate or how long its bullets could then reach. Comparatively, this would make his abilities amongst the other protagonists way more powerful, and would most likely lead to less interesting fights. I'm sure that retroactive restrictions could have been placed onto his abilities, but that would probably also conflict with how he was originally introduced in some way or another. Retcons in fiction can be totally fine and valid, but if a writer messes up and makes them super obvious, it really lessens a fan's experience with a given story. It's for that reason that Araki had eventually decided to scrap the idea entirely, and while there was never a competition between him and Avdol, Whole Horse's spot on the team was eventually taken, but instead by the unlikely addition of Iggy the dog. And what an interesting choice that was! Regardless of that, I'm not quite done talking about this subject yet, and want to switch up the focus back onto Avdol. The idea that he was intended to originally remain dead after the fight in India is a concept that floated around the fanbase for some time. Time. It was even something I had thought was the case for a long while when I was first catching up on the series, so I totally understand why people would believe this to be the case. His re-inclusion later on did feel a bit out of nowhere in a way. Nonetheless, Avdol's return was evidently always the route that the story was going to take. In a later Jojonium interview, Araki explained and would clarify, I put him out of commission for a while when the party was in India. I did that because I never want readers to get bored or complacent with the events taking place, so I wanted to inject a little reality in there having someone get sacrificed every once in a while. I wasn't planning on keeping him gone for long. 
The thing is, I thought it was kind of lame to have someone who died just come back to life immediately, so I wanted to come up with a good reason as well as an appropriate setting to reintroduce him. In the end, I brought him back just before the party got to Egypt, but at the time, I didn't have any specific plans as to when I would bring him back. I just wrote what felt natural to me at the time. Araki even commented on how, back then, he didn't think Avdol was that popular amongst readers. So even if there was some sort of meddling by an editor, they would have had no reason to want to bring the character back. Thus, it's pretty clear that Avdol's eventual role was something that Araki had simply wanted himself all along. And to be fair, it was very much a surprise to literally everyone, so in a way, I guess he succeeded in what he was trying to accomplish. Accomplish. Avdol's Backstory This is a brief segment of the iceberg that I had actually added myself during my research for other topics because I thought it was really cool, and also because I have zero self-control with this script and I just like adding more information because oops! Avdol is the only member of the Stardust Crusaders to not ever be given a clear backstory, which obviously sucks because I know a lot of people who really like Avdol and would probably love to know more about the guy. All of the current canon information we're aware of is that he met Joseph in Egypt prior to the events that take place in Part 3, as well as having a chance encounter with Dio. What we don't know is anything about his origins, his childhood, and if he was born with a stand or had it materialize later on. But you know who knows the most about Avdol? His creator. While I was reading some interviews, I noticed that Araki made some brief offhanded comments about Avdol's potential history. As he started to close off a discussion about the character, he said, If I were to write a portion of the story centering on Avdol, I think it would have been an origin story featuring his family. In particular, his relationship with his father. It might end up being a bit too mature of a story for Weekly Shonen Jump. This confirms to me that Araki has at least some semblance of an idea for what Avdol Doll's past actually looked like. And I think I speak for everyone when I say, can an Avdol one-shot story? Maybe? Eh? I feel like there are so many smaller aspects of JoJo that I'd love to see fleshed out more. So maybe having a collection of short one-shots focusing around various characters could be a great way to develop them. Listen, I know I ask for a lot, but please, Araki, please! It literally prints money! My money! From my wallet! Anyway, transition. My buddy Gerber is gonna talk to you guys about another guest entry. This time about the JoJo escape room. Yeah, they had an officially branded JoJo escape room at one point. Very cool stuff. Take it away, Gerber. From 2017 to 2018, there was an escape room styled attraction based on the story of Stardust Crusaders, which toured around Japan and briefly at a couple anime conventions in America. The attraction was a second joint project between Scrap and the production committee of the JoJo anime. The story takes place during part three as Jotaro and company make their way to Egypt. Along the way, they stop at a mysterious hotel Hotel, hearing a voice that belongs to a newsstand user, made specifically for this story named Deja Maker. Deja tells them they have one hour to live, as those who cannot escape the hotel within an hour will disappear without a trace through the power of his stand, House of Holy. Unable to locate the stand user, the Crusaders are trapped as the walls of the room begin to writhe, with the hotel becoming a convoluted maze. Without any real way to damage the maze, the group has to figure out a way to find their enemy's true form and attack before they disappear. Participants in the attraction basically solve puzzles, to this end trying to help the Crusaders escape the building manipulating stand before time runs out. It's also worth noting that there was a similar escape room based around the events of Part 5 that happened a bit later on. Just like with the Part 3 one, the Part 5 escape room has its own unique antagonist named Scatola. But in comparison to Deja Maker, he looks like a fucking dweeb that even I would shove into a locker, so I'm not gonna comment further. Also, speaking of Deja Maker, once again, it turns out he's actually voiced by the same guy who voices Ringo Rodigan in All-Star Battle. The voice actor's name name is Oroki Yasumoto, and this would mark the second JoJo character that he has voiced. Can't wait for number three, my boy. Up next, we have another guest entry read by Connor McKinley. He's a voice actor and Dungeons and Dragons type of guy. And the reason that I first found out about him online years ago was because of this part seven animation that he voiced in. I think that this was one of the first pieces of Steel Ball Run content that I had ever seen online. And it holds a special place in my JoJo heart, which is very big because there's a lot of JoJo stuff I, I put in my JoJo heart. Anyway, uh, here's Connor. Part 7 is an AU of Part 1. 
While the ending of Part 6, Stone Ocean, seemed to mark the end of the original JoJo's storyline, Araki obviously didn't stop the series there. He went on to continue with Part 7, Steel Ball Run, and given that this new arc was numbered in such a way, many people came under the impression that this was somehow a further continuation of the previous decades-long storyline. Many people would have you believe that this isn't the case, that Steel Ball Run and Onward is a hard reboot of the series, set in an entirely new continuity. But interestingly, this might not actually be the case. When speaking on the subject in various interviews over the years, Araki has confusingly made statements for both cases, saying that it is indeed connected to the new altered universe formed at the end of Part 6, but also saying that it isn't, and that Part 7 Onward is actually just a full reboot. Given the contradictions of him saying both of these, we still don't concretely know which is the case. Though, at the very least, fans have speculated that Part 7 and Onward could be intended as a sort of alternate universe to the original series. Specifically in regards to this segment, that Steel Ball Run is an alternate universe version of Phantom Blood. For one, the main protagonist, Johnny Joestar, is obviously a counterpart to the original protagonist, Jonathan Joestar. Gyro Zeppeli is, of course, a counterpart to William Zeppeli, Johnny's father, George, shares a name with Jonathan's father, George, and of course, rival character Diego Brando is very clearly based on our favorite vampire, Dio. That's not the end of the similarities, though, of course. In part one, Jonathan's trusty pet is a dog named Danny, whose senseless killing by Dio is part of the initial conflict between the two that drives Jonathan throughout the series. In part seven, Johnny too has a pet named Danny, but he's a white mouse. At the suggestion of his brother Nicholas, Johnny sets the mouse free into the woods when his father orders him to kill the poor little fella. Afterwards, during a practice run, Nicholas is riding a new wild stallion which is startled by a white mouse, throwing Nicholas off and killing him by accident. Johnny believes that the mouse, who he sees scurrying off into the woods, is none other than Danny. The time period where Phantom Blood began was in the late 1800s in Victorian England. Steel Ball Run takes place in the Wild West, which was happening at about at the same time, just in a parallel place, further solidifying the similar but skewed iterations of Phantom Blood's ideas and characters that are transplanted into Part 7. Part 7 also features a fighting ability that isn't stands. Instead of Hamon, Zeppelis in Steel Ball Run are the masters of the spin technique. And although stands do still eventually appear in Part 7, spin is similar to Hamon in many ways. Other little parallels include a character named Dario, who is still the father of our current Dio XB Diego, a character named Tarkus, and several characters with the last name Pendleton. Steel Ball Run, in my opinion, is more of a combination of multiple parts rather than just being an alternate version of Part 1. At a surface level, I do think that it's meant to serve as a parallel to Phantom Blood in many ways, but it also seems to take influence and in aspects from Parts 2 and 3 as well. Beyond just the obvious inclusion of stands as a concept, various racers in the Steel Ball Run have their namesake rooted in previous parts, like Fritz von Stroheim being a reference to Rudolf von Stroheim, and Ermd Avdol being a reference to Muhammad Avdol. Besides stuff like this though, there's also situational and structural references to previous arcs in the series. A particularly interesting character in this regard is Magent Magent. His eventual fate in the story is analogous to the fate of Cars at the end of Part 2. After Magent Magent gets stuck at the bottom of the Delaware River, the story states that he eventually stopped thinking, much in the same way that Cars did when he got launched into space. Sometimes though, it seems like a Rocky instead combines multiple past aspects of Jojo together to create something entirely new. While Gyro is intended to be a reflection of William Zappelli given his relationship with Johnny, his actual canonical name is revealed to be Caesar, which is a name that is rather directly pulled from Caesar Zeppeli in Battle Tendency, meaning that his character as a whole can be seen as sort of a remix, pulling characteristics together from two previous icons of the franchise. Honestly, the term remix is a pretty great way to describe the canon of parts 7 through 9. I feel like they all have inspiration rooted in previous parts, but Araki then takes that inspiration and remixes it all together into something familiar but entirely new. It's a really cool way to write a fresh new story while still having it feel distinctly Jojo, and I haven't seen any other manga author do this quite the same way that Araki does, so honestly, props to this dude. Just another thing that I really admire about the guy. 
Say Hi to Virginia. Before the release of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Hirohiko Araki published an obscure sci-fi one-shot manga in 1981 called Say Hi to Virginia. The story follows Hiroshi Takamoto, the second-in-command and engineer of the space freighter Dillinger, which is crossing space along the Venus Earth to deliver cargo within 316 days. A mysterious figure calls the ship, appearing on its screen to inform Hiroshi that two bombs have been installed somewhere inside the first being set to explode in the escape pod in 30 seconds, and the second in the engine room in one hour. The figure mocks Hiroshi by naming itself as Virginia, and telling him to say hi to Virginia before hanging up their call. Feeling the sudden explosion of the destroyed escape pod, Hiroshi and the captain, Matt Jackson, realize that the threat is serious and get looking for the second bomb. Upon discovering it, they realize it has a barrier that will trigger the explosion if anyone approaches it. The two devise a plan, where the human crew shelter themselves in the cockpit, and the block containing the bomb is deprived of its atmosphere, so their robot, named Clyde, can safely disarm the bomb. Through a lot of tense moments and near-death mistakes, Clyde eventually manages to disarm the bomb just in time. Content with their victory, Jackson goes back to his room to take a nap. After which, Hiroshi is then called by the bomber again, who seems happy that the monotony of their journey was broken up by something exciting. The figure announces that he is on the ship and will now pursue Hiroshi in a game of cat and mouse. And the story ends with a cut to reveal that Matt Jackson, the captain, was actually the bomber the whole time. You know, bud, a nearly year-long cargo trip does sound pretty tedious, but nearly blowing up your entire ship to smithereens in the middle of space seems like a pretty stupid way to keep things lively. Maybe pack a Nintendo Switch beforehand or something? I don't know. It's always fascinating seeing Araki tackle such vastly different genres and settings in his work. And while he may be most well-known for JoJo, he has quite the backlog of experimental stuff like this. And this probably won't be the last time it gets brought up on this iceberg either, so look forward to that. Garfield 40th Anniversary Book for Garfield's 40th birthday, you know, the cat, a celebratory art book was created that featured various pieces of fan art. This image, the one that you're seeing right now, is one of the drawings that made it in. Yep, Garfield Jotaro, in an official Garfield art book. I didn't think I'd have much to say about this, but uh, Found out the original artist follows me on Twitter. Yeah, I recognized the username while I was trying to find a high quality image. So, uh, hey, Wisdom Eel. You'll probably see this video at some point. Question, why and how? Kira's co-worker. In the introductory arc of Part 4's villain, Yoshikage Kira, we also briefly meet some of his co-workers, three women and one man, the latter of whom explains a couple of things about Kira, including how he's a pretty boring guy who never accepts invitations to go anywhere. This man also briefly appears during the fight with Sheer Heart Attack, seeing Kira's hand cut off and really only appearing for a couple of panels at most. The reason I'm bringing him up is that he's kind of famous in the Japanese JoJo fandom, yeah, this one-off bit character with no name became a Japanese JoJo meme. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense as to why. Despite only appearing for several panels at most, this man cryptically expresses a strange amount of specific knowledge about Yoshikage Kira. You know, the character who has been built up to be a mystery? The character who has voluntarily prevented any information about himself from being public knowledge? Always hiding in the background? How the fuck does this guy know so much about Kira? I'm pretty sure that at the point where he's first introduced, he knows more about the guy than literally anybody else in the entirety of Morio. Because of this and his unprompted need to info dump to random people, fans have gone about reimagining him as a much more prominent character in the JoJo mythos. Whether it's as someone who saves Kira's life or even taking Josuke's place as the one to beat him down, this random businessman has been put in all sorts of weird contexts.
texts. The mass obsession with this character has also been acknowledged by Reiki Taki, a former member of staff on the anime adaptation. The dude drew a comic about the guy. In this one-page gag manga, the gang from Part 5 try to get Moody Blues to transform into the boss and reveal his identity. Though in a strange twist of fate, it instead morphs into this fucking guy. No need to fret, however, because just like he knows way too much about Kira, this businessman also seems to know a lot of secret information about Diavolo. And he's fairly casual with talking about it. And just in case you guys think I'm exaggerating this as some sort of bit, I even found an unofficial character popularity poll where Kira's co-worker ranked above characters like Jonathan Joestar, Avdol, and Anasui. Shit's insane. Bandai Namco add this man to All-Star Battle now. Hey guys, next part of this series is going to be coming out soon. I have no excuses as to why this one took so long. Oh, also check out my other JoJo videos or anything if you want. Uh, please do that. Yes, thank you. Goodbye.